After World War II, Oppenheimer was like national hero. He was on the cover of Life magazine. He's on the cover of Time magazine. He became the symbol of what science can do. He's this head in the clouds, theoretical physicist. Nobody would have thought anything he did had any relevance. And now he's the guy who's gonna tell you how the world needs to run if you don't wanna die. He never regretted using the weapons on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. He never regretted what he did at Los Alamos. He was very clear on this point. What he hoped would have come out of all that death was a new sensibility about how we have to not have wars anymore and treaties and arrangements that were going to fundamentally rework the world to be what in his mind would be a more peaceful and better place. He did a lot of work behind the scenes to try to make that happen, both during and after World War II. And he tried to use this newfound respect to advance the kinds of policies that he thought would save the world. International control of atomic energy, basically banning nuclear weapons. He sort of spearheads that work in the United States and sets the terms of it. Trying to undo some of the secrecy of the Manhattan Project. He creates behind the scenes the whole declassification system that we still use in the federal government today. Pushing against the building of thermonuclear weapons, the H-bomb debate. He instead advocates for smaller nuclear weapons and having more small weapons as opposed to like giant weapons. And he's pretty successful at influencing US policy, but he's also going against pretty big forces. He made a lot of enemies. He made this both through his policy advocacy and he also made it through some of his sort of personal style. Oppenheimer was a very clever guy and he knew how to make people not feel clever. He embarrassed Louis Strauss in a congressional hearing once. Strauss never forgot that. He embarrassed Teller many times. Teller never forgot that. He accumulated enough enemies in enough places that by the early 50s, he was in a very vulnerable position. After the H-bomb debate, a number of the people who had been the winners of the debate, like Teller, they saw in Oppenheimer an enemy. And this was after they had built the H-bomb. They thought that the fact that they had built it proved that they were right and that Oppenheimer was wrong. And that not only was Oppenheimer wrong, but he was just an untrustworthy person and you shouldn't let him near anything to do with nuclear policy anytime going forward. A committee in Congress was trying to create an internal top secret history of the H-bomb. And they were doing this with the idea of showing that Oppenheimer had been wrong. In the process of making this, they worked with some scientists to make sure that they had the technical details right. So they went to a scientist who had been very important in the Manhattan Project, gave him a copy of maybe six pages explaining the technical details of the H-bomb. And he took a train from Princeton to Washington, D.C. And somehow, we don't know how, he lost them. This is a major scandal. You lost the secret of the H-bomb. This became this sort of major investigation. They never found the pages. They never figured out what happened to them. The guy who is organizing this project, this congressional staffer, he becomes singled out as like, congressional staffer run amok. He gets fired. He had been one of Oppenheimer's enemies. The whole point of this was to attack Oppenheimer. And he starts thinking, who did this benefit? Who did losing these documents benefit? It benefited Oppenheimer. And so he writes a letter to J. Edgar Hoover in which he says, I think there's more reason than not to believe that Oppenheimer is a Soviet spy and always has been. Now, this is nonsense. Hoover knows this is nonsense. Like nobody really thinks that Oppenheimer is a spy, but this becomes the opportunity. Strauss takes this letter, he goes to Eisenhower, he says, you know, I, I think we need to make a wall between Oppenheimer and everything else until we find this out. And this sets off this procedure in which Strauss goes to Oppenheimer and says, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna take away your clearance. And you can either just accept that or you can challenge it. You have a right to a hearing. And Oppenheimer says, I want the hearing, I'm gonna fight this. And this leads to many months of a secret hearing in which Oppenheimer and a lawyer are basically being confronted with this mountain of FBI documentation about everything Oppenheimer has ever done wrong in his life or any decisions he made that might look dodgy in retrospect. And there were many. And in the end, this committee decided that his judgment was not great and maybe he shouldn't have access to secrets anymore. And they stripped him of his clearance. He never really recovered from that. That, that was sort of, for him, the ultimate tragedy of, of his life was becoming so influential and then having it all taken away from him.